We're going to talk about modern Montessori. And you must have some hey, interest Kurt? in that since you're My, the few, the proud, text. the brave, and you're here. Um, I'm not going to introduce the panelists. They're awesome. They're going to talk about their schools in a few minutes. Um, what I would love to know from you okay, is, you. I'm curious, like, why you're here. And when you hear the word modern Montessori, what do you think it means? Modern Montessori. Preferably in six words or less, but short descriptions of what you think modern Montessori means. Oh, this is what happens when you sit up front. I, <laughs> I'm thinking maybe a modernized version of it, but what I'm here for is because it's a model that's personalized and individualized to the student. Um, it's more connected to the workplace eventually. Great. Modern Montessori, what comes to mind, Blossom? I would have to say that it is the one stone model that you'll be hearing about because it's all about student voice and student driven learning. OneStone.org, uh, a, a new, uh, new high school in Boise. Integrating technology. Okay, so you think it's the old version of Montessori plus technology? Okay, good. Corey, what, what do you think? Modern Montessori, anything come to mind? Yeah, I'd say um, self-driven and connected. Uh, modern Montessori, what comes to mind? Well, I think it's tied closely to the whole personalization of learning, right? So it's a, it's a natural pivot for where we're at. Um, Andy, modern Montessori, what comes to mind? So um, there are... Th Th three or four models of next-gen learning challenges schools nationally that are doing this. The most well-built, most thoughtful one is in Austin, Texas. You should go to their website, Montessori for All, Magnolia Montessori. And the reason is this is like, think of a Hollywood movie where it's like, you know, get smart meets flipper or whatever. This is, this is Montessori meets blended meets no excuses. And all of their, their school designers have deep experience in all three, and they're melding them into one really cool out model. Is there another modern Montessori in the family? Uh, there is. That would be my sister, Liz, um, who's a DC public school principal, not a charter, regular elementary school. Don't you love this guy? He's like, I'm gonna run through all my family members for you now. Um, her school is Horace Mann. You can find it by going to the gettingsmart.com list of 85 schools across the country uh, to go visit. Horace Mann is listed as number one. One of the reasons why is that Liz is really gifted at integrating and absorbing um, lots of different inputs. So there are teachers at her school that are Montessori trained teachers that are bringing that in. There are Reggio Emilio teachers. There are LARPing teachers, live action role play. And somehow it all becomes part of this flywheel that creates a, a really great um, working learning environment. And in the, uh, in the podcast that we did with Liz, she talks about it being a mashup of direct instruction and Montessori. Um, so, yeah. So it, uh, great example of a faculty that's constructed a learning model and then had the opportunity to work with architects to turn it into a building. So when you hear modern Montessori, what questions come to mind? What, what would you like the panel most uh, to answer for you in the next half an hour? A, a question for the panel, go. Um, what aspects of Montessori can I bring back to my charter school in New York? Awesome. So are there things that I can grab and go? Are there elements of it? So, yes, a question for the panel. So from a traditional school district, right, we're 10,000 students, how do we disrupt our current programming to bring in elements of Montessori? Awesome. So another, another one, and, and um, we've got a couple of Montessori experts, and um, I want them to address the fact that Montessori is this well-honed instructional system, right? They've spent 100 years building the system, so can and should you actually grab stuff out of it and use it? or? Conversely, can you bolt stuff onto Montessori and have it work? So we're going to ask them their opinion on that. What else would you like to know? Um, from Grand Rapids Public Schools, we have one of the nation's oldest pre-K-12 public Montessoris, and we're actually opening new schools, but the challenge has been Montessori-trained teachers, and I'm really curious to know in modern Montessori and whatever you're going to tell us, what's the trick behind getting those, those highly trained Montessori teachers? Is, um, is the museum school one of yours? 
Uh, are there any aspects of Montessori in that model? Cool. It's a, a new uh, XQ winning school in Grand Rapids. It's on our 100 high schools worth visiting. What would you like to know? Um, I'm from San Antonio ISD, and we're opening the first public um, K-2 Montessori school. And so want to know what are some critical success factors? What should we be looking out for as we open up in the fall? So opening a Montessori. All right, one, two more. Anything you want to know? Yeah? What would you like to know? A little bit more about modern Montessori and, and how, it, how it coexists with standardized state testing. What about standardized testing? Okay. All right, one more. Um, what would you like to know? Um, integrating tech, particularly in early learning, because traditional Montessori does not do that. Doesn't do it, right? So there's a lot of Waldorf schools that are like no tech, but I think you'll see, given this is the called the modern Montessori, that all of these people make um, good and interesting uses of tech. All right, um, let's get started. Caroline is going to help me with. Uh, pictures of our school. Where, um, what school do we want to start with? Ah, so this is a great school a couple miles down the road uh, run by uh, Mike Farley. Give, give us a quick overview of uh, American International. Sure, we're a K-12 school. Uh, in our third year we have roughly 1,400 students. Um, at the high school level we attract students from overseas as well. Uh, our goal is to have 20 percent of our high school students be international. Presently, we have students from 20 different countries, a um, total of about close to 70 international students. And we're a next generation school model. Uh, we've, we emphasize personalized learning. We want students to take agency and responsibility for their learning uh, K through 12. And you're, um, you have a Montessori primary? <clears throat> Our, we have early childhood and, and lower elementary Montessori. So uh, up through grade three is Montessori. And we feel like the Montessori principles are then applied uh, beyond, <coughs> beyond that. But the program uh, no longer re involves Montessori trained teachers and, and so forth. So you're a K-12 school, and you speak eloquently of why you have a Montessori primary. What, what's the primary benefit that's created in your primary grades that helps your kids be more successful? So. Um, John Holt in 1964 referred to uh, children coming into the system as insatiable uh, uh, questioners and mentioned that by third grade the system has converted them into tentative answer givers. And so for us to create a school that's, that wants to place students in the driver's seat of their own learning and to personalize learning, uh, to give students choice, we wanted a program at the early elementary that didn't that, that was true to those basic principles. Uh, Mark Smith, our principal through the first three years, he commented about how he'd want to take some of our high school students down to the lower elementary or, or the kindergarten so that they could see what self-directed learning looked like. And it's, uh, it's a powerful way to start students on their, on their path. We, one more thing, we, we want to create an education system that is personalized not just in pace and and, and choice, but, but responds to students' individual passion. And so rather than stifle that passion, we want to enliven and, and embrace the multitude of passions that students have in their learning. And we feel Montessori helps uh, lay that foundation. Neva, we're going to get to you in a few minutes, but you, um, you have this one stone high school in, in uh, Boise. Do you, do, you, do you buy the idea that, that Montessori might get kids ready for a school like yours? Absolutely. We are all about student ownership and their own learning and student voice. It's different for us because we, we grew up in the nonprofit sector, not in the school sector. So uh, in full disclosure, I had to do some research on what Montessori was for this. But I think that that has been to our advantage is to grow this organically from the student-led and directed perspective. Yeah. But see, you guys have seen young people that have come in from low agency environments, and it's really been hard, right? Very hard. So it for feels them, like the logic here is pretty strong. The fit is perfect. Yeah. Uh, for students who are in the traditional model, where they're just receiving passively, in our model, when they came in, they spent a lot of time just saying, will you just tell me what to do? Right. And then we had to say, well, what do you think All we right. should do? Go back to that first slide. Um, 
we're going to talk about facilities in a minute, but like you must be going, what the heck is going on there? So get quick overview of what what are we seeing there on the left side? So this is at our main entrance uh, into the what we call the atrium. Uh, lots of natural light. The, the glass that you see to the right is right, it looks is like Disneyland, at right? the other end. And, um, and so this is kind of the main thoroughfare of our school. And when I first walked into this building five years ago, it was completely you know, empty and, and kind of dilapidated. But I felt it would be easier to convert this building into what we wanted in a new school than it would so be. So it was like a, a uh, converted building. retail mall? Well, before it fun was parks? actually a family fun center. Like they had yeah. roller, a roller rink and bowling alley, restaurants, arcades. They had a carousel. Just um, miniature golf inside, um, a 3D movie theater. So it's a it's a super fun space. I just wanted you to know what uh, what you're looking at. That's the main entry. All right, let's um, let's jump to uh, Jeff. Oh, one stone. All right, Neva. Um, Jeff, Neva. This might be the coolest high school in America. I don't know. Go on. Tell, <laughs> tell us about um, one stone. <laughs> When talking about One Stone, it's really helpful to know where we came from because we were started in 2008 as a community-based nonprofit. We were started by a group of students who were interested in doing service learning that was guided and directed by students versus what they were experiencing, which was service that was guided by adults that students just showed up at. So we started this in 2008 with the mission to make students better leaders in the world a better place. And it exploded. And it was an idea whose time had come, this idea of community project-based learning that was student-led and directed. Over time, what we saw was that we were attracting kids who were also interested in doing things, working with our nonprofit partners, building websites, videos, graphic design. And what we saw was there were students who were really interested in learning those things. And there was an absence of that in the community. So we took what we had and we built upon that to launch Two Birds, which is an advertising agency that's student-led and directed, a social venture for One Stone. So it's also an opportunity for kids to learn about social entrepreneurship and build a real-world portfolio with clients. And then in that process, we were attracting more and more students who were entrepreneurial, but again, recognizing there just weren't those opportunities to empower kids to learn those things. So we launched that. So over time, we were working with these students in these three different platforms, really doing this community project-based learning, this real-world relevant, teaching all of them to, teaching them design thinking and then using design thinking to build out our programs. And students had said to us over the years, I learned so much at One Stone, why can't One Stone be school? And we are a student-led and directed organization with a board that is two-thirds students, one-third adults. Do I, do I get to talk about this right now? So I went to the board meeting, um, Thursday night, there's 19 board members, 17 are teenagers. <laughs> it was, um, first of all, it was the best prepared and best organized board materials that I've ever seen. I'm on 12 boards. I go to a lot of board meetings. It was the best run board meeting that I've ever sat through because there was, a, in part, because there was an expectation that everybody had to review all the material before they came to the meeting. So the meeting was really problem solving and design thinking. So this is not just a student-centered organization. It actually is a student-led organization that has after school and a, and a high school. Mm -hmm. hmm? Oh. Podcast on that on Thursday. <laughs> Podcast on the uh, board meeting Thursday. All right. Before, well, while we've so rudely interrupted you, um, Blossom, anything unique about this? Um, the Albertson Foundation is one of the big supporters of uh, One Stone, but what, what do you like about One Stone? <laughs> Primarily, it's that it really is something that's broken the model. So what we've seen over the course of the last three years is that students are, uh, they really are solving some of the most tricky problems that we have in our state, especially in the education and, and some of the healthcare stuff. So they are actively involved at um, levels that most adults can't engage in very well, and they're doing a great job. Great. Good. What else, anything else you want to add about the uh, school? Well, I heard a lot of questions about how to incorporate it into existing systems. And I think we really had an advantage that we weren't a school, that we were this student-led and directed, organically grown organization. Yeah. So I would say it's the mindset 
is, is the biggest thing that you can take into your schools of the student ownership and really believing in the power of student voice. Yeah. You know, one other question that we could pick up, there was a question about opening a new school, and I know you're opening a primary and she opened a high school, but one or two tips on things that were most important in opening or things that you would do differently? Mm -hmm. um, I would say uh, embrace ambiguity, fail forward, bring optimism. Um, it's very challenging. It is a, it's, it's very hard to break a system, but it's also one of the most rewarding things that you will ever see in action when yeah. done correctly. It's to, it is transformative of a system, and we think to the world. So we have a report on gettingsmart.com, a Walton-funded effort, 100 tips on opening a new school. So we, we, we actually did this survey of um, 75 top school developers in America last summer uh, to inform OneStone's work. So that's a, a great report that I hope is useful. I think it's 100 tips on opening a new school. And then we'll, I'll be, I'm writing this all up too, so I'll post like a recap blog on um, getting smart by the end of this week too with a bunch of anything he mentions, any of these links I'm writing down and we'll write a blog about. All right. Um, Wildflower. I love that building. Matt, you have a network of Montessori schools. We have a network of tiny one room shop front teacher led uh, Montessori schools. So, like how many kids in a? 25 kids, two teachers, um, 1,200 square feet uh, on a regular city and, street. And you're, you're early learning all the way to high school? Start at 12 weeks up to 18, yep. Uh, where are they located? Uh, we've got 11 so far. Eight of them are in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one in northern Massachusetts, two in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And the next places to open up, in addition to growing in those spaces, are Minnesota and Denver. And, and are you traditional Montessori or Montessori Plus? How would you describe your learning model? I would say we are both a very authentic Montessori implementation, uh, and then we have some things that are not instead of Montessori, but that are places where Montessori didn't cover. Uh, for example, uh, the teacher empowerment concept. I've always thought it was interesting that Montessori schools spend so much time thinking about student agency, and then you look at the structure of the adults, and it's these command and control principal, grade level heads, teachers, assistants, aides, uh, passing along orders. So we have a model of teacher leadership, non-hierarchical control. Uh, and then one thing that I think is people find interesting about our work and that we're uh, working on is Montessori puts a lot, of, uh, a lot of weight on the role of the teacher as an observer and scientist on the basis of that observation. And if you talk to modern Montessori teachers and ask them how that is going, they will quickly tell you that it is not possible to track what 30 kids are doing all the time. Uh, and as a result, Montessori is susceptible to kids falling through cracks. Right. Uh, well, one of the things we are doing is we are taking the types of sensors that are in your cell phone, accelerometers and gyroscopes uh, and proximity sensors and embedding them inside of Montessori materials. So the kids don't know they're interacting with technology, which is important to us, but the teachers are getting logs of everything the kids do, not just what yeah. they're doing, but the amount of intensity and whether they're even using things right. So uh, another example of that is uh, Roots Elementary in Denver. Anybody been there? So you've been there? Did you like it or did it make your head hurt? It, so how would you describe uh, Roots, Colleen? Um, controlled chaos. <laughs> and uh, in terms of kids using technology, what, where, how do they use the technology to manage station rotation? Yeah, uh, with uh, QR codes, each of the kids have their own individual calendars, so they know and they begin to kind of navigate their own school day. Yeah. So they're collecting background data as kids rotate station to station, and many of them are maker, as, as some are computer-based, but some are maker. So Matt, I think this is an example of uh, the sort of the future of being able to do something Montessori-ish, but with a lot of technology in the background. Uh, Matt, because you, you run so many schools, you've learned a lot about teacher training, so could you answer the question about uh, teacher training? How do, you, how do you do that? I think it's a good question. Like, we, well, why don't we do teacher sourcing and teacher training? I was gonna say, we source for people with AMI or AMS credentials, and we don't train them ourselves. Uh, so that may not be super helpful uh, to uh, whoever asked that question. 
Um, you know, there are a lot of Montessori trained teachers. There's 22,000 Montessori schools in the world, uh, and there are hundreds of thousands of Montessori trained teachers. So there's a lot to work with, but... Uh, are there any dedicated higher ed programs? There are a mix of AMS, American Montessori Society, uh, programs embedded inside of higher ed, uh, and Ameri uh, Association Montessori International programs that are typically free of yeah. uh, ed schools and just operate as standalone credentialing centers. I could, could just comment on this. In Utah, there's definitely a shortage of Montessori trained teachers. There's a, a university that offers Montessori. The Montessori training tends to be very expensive. Yep. And, um, and so what, what we've done is we've, we've paid for training for a lot of teachers uh, who have maybe been uh, co-teaching initially, and, and uh, it's an expense, but we don't pay them at the same rate okay. initially until they've gone through that training. So really, it's, it's comparable. Matt, do you, do you have to pay? And, and let me mention. Yeah, go ahead. And then we require them to, to stay for three years if they were to to not continue for three years, then yep. they would, it would be prorated. They would have to so, pay, well, pay some um, of that back. Th the other thing I wanted to make sure that we mentioned about your model is that you also have sort of a bolt-on direct instruction uh, to make sure that kids are getting the reading skills they need by the end of third grade, right? Yes, yeah, so this might be kind of problematic for some Montessori uh, teachers, but, but the challenge for us, our school is a public charter, and so we cannot... Um, take students at three years old and have them participate in the full Mont Montessori program for early childhood. And, and partly because of that, perhaps the, the deficit for literacy has, has been pronounced. As we assess students, the regular Montessori program starting in kindergarten and then going forward wasn't being adequate to produce the, the literacy levels right. that, that we were comfortable with. And so we've, we've added a program called Reading Horizons that's part teacher facilitated and part uh, technology facilitated. Yeah. And, um, and the teachers then are developing some Montessori works that help support that kind of fall within that same framework. And Matt, does that make you nervous? I mean, as a general topic, it doesn't. Maria Montessori was tough as nails. And if you go back and read her books, yeah. she had this whole protocol for what to do when six-year-olds show up without being able to read. Because you can't expect the same thing that they will be drawn automatically into at three will work at six. They're not yeah. interested in the same things. And so she had this plan for what do you do with these 15-minute high-dose tutoring sessions with kids, 15 minutes, then stop, give them a break, stop the minute they seem like they're not having fun, and keep repeating until they can read. Uh, it sounds a lot like things we do today yeah. and think Montessorians should be scared of. So I want to go back to this training thing. As you, as you think about growing your network all over the country, maybe all over the world, all over the, world. The, the, the human capital has got to be high on the list of, of potential barriers to scale. So any thoughts on how you're going to deal with that? I mean, at the beginning, as I said, we, there are more teachers than there are us. So uh, we don't, and we need, you know, to run your own school is sort of not a first gig. So we recruit people who are veterans uh, of at least five years uh, of classroom lead guide experience, or else we think putting them out on their own uh, is not the wise thing to do. Uh, we do exactly what you described. Uh, um, we have after school coordinators and other non Montessori trained positions, and the people in those we are paying for their Montessori training and planning for them to be the people who start more schools later. Uh, and we would not be surprised if we found ourselves involved in teacher training someday. I think we probably have a couple years before we have to do it, but. Yeah. All right, Jeff, um, I, I want you to circle back and talk about the human capital because you know a lot about scaling talent, but let, let's just get a quick overview of uh, Millennium. Sure, so uh, Millennium is a, uh, a brand new program. We're based in San Francisco. It's an innovation lab, so it's a lab school targeted at ad early adolescents and middle school ages. We have our first class of sixth graders this year. Um, it was really born out of a Montessori-inspired uh, intention. And uh, so my background was professionally in corporate education, developing large school leadership applications for Fortune 500. But I had three kids, still have three kids, and I've spent 16 years in a Montessori environment with those kids and was active in the school and helped them design and launch a junior high program. And the way that I connect those dots is in the leadership development world, we watched you know, executives reach a point in their career where they stopped. And almost always, that was an internal issue, not a, not a, they weren't lacking intelligence, they weren't lacking resources. This was some emotional trauma, some lack of development, some lack of self-awareness. 
And what was interesting to me was to connect the dots back to Montessori, because I think what Montessori's real gift is, is teaching students self-awareness. I think that what it does better than anything else is to teach young people to look inside before they look outside. And their ability to teach children to self-reflect and to know who they are and to generate a sense of self from an inner place. And so uh, when we started Millennium, we said, you know, the goal wasn't necessarily to spawn more Montessoris, although we were Montessori inspired. What we want to do is figure out, is there a way to actually teach self-awareness? The actual output isn't the school, the output is the student. Can you create a methodology that's grounded in current developmental science that actually teaches self-awareness and self-discovery as, as an explicit, explicit intention of the school? Um, so what we've got is a project-based environment. The kids are using uh, big projects out in the world. You see some pictures of that. Um, it's sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. They work in teams. They go out in the world, and they are community service projects where they can help. And then they have to come back and learn the academics they need to solve the problems out in the real world. Um, but a good part of the day is spent in reflection and journaling and connection and small group advisories where the kids process issues with each other because that, that's what we think we're really building. And you're, you're excited about the advisories and think there's some potential there? Yeah, I mean, um, when you look at the heart of all the different things we're throwing into the stew, what seems to be having the biggest effect yeah. is we get the kids together in small groups to talk with each other. So it's peer to peer. Right. And kind of like in a Hartman's discussion, um, the facilitator's job is just to quietly support this discovery amongst the kids. Yeah. And so it's teaching social emotional skills, self-awareness, conflict resolution. Um, it's teaching the kids the sense of agency that we're talking about, which is to ask them what do they want to learn and how do they want to solve the problem. So it's, it's, it's flipping the dynamic of the, the so role of the teacher. So where does the school go from here? Is it middle school or 6 to 12? What will happen? Well, right now our, um, our charter is to be uh, a 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Okay. We've got an awful lot of demand to show how this progresses all the way right. through high school. Why, why middle? Why, um, why not elementary? We started at middle because most of the research indicated that um, identity formation and adolescent development identity formation kind of happens around age 12, right. the beginning. You're, you're forming your sense of self throughout your life, but to be awake enough and mature enough to engage in this type of self-discovery, you had right. to have a certain age. And you know, I think oftentimes if you wait till high school to have this conversation, it's too late. Uh, the patterns are formed, the mo mental models and beliefs. So we're hoping we can get the hook in now and get them thinking differently and then extend it all the way through high school. Right. I would just add that yeah. I think that generally in our school systems that the middle school is the least well served. It's an, a period of time with yeah. great potential that we squander. All right, I'm going to do a uh, lightning round and talk about technology and what role it plays in your uh, modern Montessori. So Mike, how would you describe your use of technology? And you, you can do quick well, All the way through, starting in fourth grade, we're one to one. So we, we use a heavy use of technology in our, in our um, Montessori K through three, it's more limited. Um, so we're, we're blended school-wide, but the, the blend of technology starting in fourth grade, most students would be spending about two hours and a day in, in your on, primary, on is it iPads, occasional, what's it look um, like? They're, they use uh, both some desktops in, in a couple of these classrooms, but then um, we use Chromebooks generally throughout the school unless students have their own laptops. All right, Jeff, what, what would we see at Millennium? Uh, well, likewise, uh, we use technology, I think, consciously as a tool. It's something that the kids take out, use, and then put away. Um, I think in answer to your question about the human capital, one of the things that we're playing with is what is actually the right skill set on the team. So instead of looking at the Montessori teacher as a unit of one that has to know all the answers to do everything, we're right. thinking of it as a cadre approach. So different aspects on the team, we'll have a neuroscientist, we'll have a developmental psychologist, we'll have a project-based learning expert, right. we'll have a maker person. So we're looking at the collective use of the talent as an intact team, they do a lot of team teaching. Uh, so I think it's a different approach to the, uh, to the human capital problem. Matt, what's your and take how, on how tech? How many students, by the way? Are, we're going to cap out at around 75 to 80 kids, 25 to and 30. It's, and uh, it's also cool that they're in a YMCA? Uh, we're in a Boys and Girls Club. Boys, boys and Girls Club. So they have school in the club during the day, and then they partner on after school program in, in the afternoon. What's your take on tech, Matt? We use tech for three things. First is uh, we use it when it is a tool to do something else. So we don't learn from the technology, but you learn to do digital photography on a camera. You learn to do a Google search on a computer. Yeah. Um, we, uh, but almost never with kids under the age of nine or 10 years old. Uh, second is uh, the technology I described before about extending the teacher's power of observation. Right. And the third is 
a lot of what we're doing is about the teacher empowerment in the one room school. And so setting teachers up so they can be the administer, administrator and the teacher in their school with no other supervision is right. another piece of technology. Neva, how do kids at One Stone use tech? It's interwoven into everything we do from a learning perspective, but I think what distinguishes One Stone and technology is that the students, all students are given a laptop when they start, and we don't take away their phones, which is really different than most of their experience in the past. So really trying to teach students how to use technology responsibly. And uh, one cool thing about One Stone is they have a makerspace called Foundry that um, has lots of high-tech tools, and that has really turn some kids into active learners, right? That, and then our, through our Two Birds program, the Creative Suite, a lot of students are really diving into that kind of software, really building amazing portfolios of work. All of our students are assessed based on portfolios. So they're in a competition right now as to who can make the, the prettiest the, portfolio. These kids actually run a marketing agency. We are one of their clients. We, we, we've had them, we've, we've taken client work and had uh, the kids develop logos and campaign uh, yeah. collateral, a website uh, for clients. So they are in business doing professional quality work, uh, getting paid for it. For Pretty all your remarkable. marketing needs. What's that? <laughs> for all your marketing needs. Yes. Two birds at Two birds. one stone. Um, all right. Any quick questions on tech before we, we we're going to shift and talk about facilities and community connections, but any tech questions? All right. We're going to talk about um, Another lightning round, and we'll do it both on, on facilities and place. So you're, you're building and sort of your wider connection to the community. You're in this really interesting building. So we're uh, right in the center of Salt Lake, of the Salt Lake metro area. Uh, so we have about 350,000 people within a five mile radius and over a million people, uh, you know, we're really within our service area. Uh, our school is about 170,000 square feet. We're maxed out in terms of what we can accommodate on site with 1,400 students. And, um, and so our, our demographics are um, kind of reflective of the general area. We're about 40% free and reduced um, in our student population. And, um, and we have, kind of, you know, in a private school, you, you might have a more select student population in terms of academic ability or otherwise. We're a public charter, so it's by random selection. And um, so we have a broad range of students. And as a charter high school, um, you start with somewhat of a bimodal population of students who maybe haven't succeeded before, as well as students who haven't been challenged sufficiently right. before, and, and not as many students in the middle. The, the cool thing about your building, Mike, is that your high school looks like your preschool. <laughs> I mean, you have big open spaces and then some breakout spaces in both, both sides of the building, right? Yeah. The, uh, we wanted to facilitate a broad modality. We, we've also invested in, in maker spaces and performing arts and, and so forth to give students an opportunity uh, to pursue their passions in this broad range. Killer realm. performing arts, right? You have a great choir program. Um, yeah, and, and dance, and, and it's, it's phenomenal. And, yeah. and drama, so. Any, um, so any anyway. uh, community connections of note? Um, we, we have staff that, per, that bring in uh, all kinds of people. Let me just mention our, our curriculum that we use is something called a GCE, Global Citizenship Experience. And so it's, it's thematic and interdisciplinary and project-based. So every unit that students have um, culminates in an action project where they're applying what they've learned and generally in the community for real-life projects. And so rather than biology, chemistry, physics, uh, or English 1, English 2, English 3, students are taking courses in food, water, energy, Disease, cure, urban design. So Eric, Eric Davis is wandering around here. Um, lead, what's the what's the company called? Uh, Global Learning Models. Global Learning Models. Uh, it's worth checking out. One thing Karen Cater from Digital Promise and I like is that they've really embraced uh, the global goals, globalgoals.org, and they really get kids um, engaged in extended challenges around. Uh, global problems, but with a sort of a local lens. So it's really a cool, and the, cool, cool model. And so because these, these projects or these, these units require students to, they first do an internal investigation where they're getting background knowledge, and then they go into an external investigation where they're working with someone in the community, an organization or, or so forth that deals with that issue, and then they do the action project. 
and then one other element, we have these two week intensives three times a year where students are immersed in one subject. Cool. It could be computer programming, uh, it could be a drama, it could be um, you know, a trip, and but that's a, that's a homelessness. Choice? Student and choice? so students have over 30 choices and if they don't like any of those, they can create their own. And so these oftentimes engage community groups and businesses and so forth in helping to provide this rich experience for students. That's great. Jeff, how does, your, how does that uh, facility contribute to your program? So a core part of the philosophy, our, our mantra is uh, real world, real self. So in addition to really exploring the individual student, we want the kids to be engaged in the real world. So it's very much a kind of classroom beyond walls thought. Uh, we're in the heart of San Francisco, we're in Hayes Valley. Uh, the kids spend a lot of their time out in the city working on their projects. Uh, one day a week is dedicated to an experiential service project, building an urban garden or something out in the world. Um, so in the facility, we're right in the middle of an urban environment. Half our kids are kids of color, half our kids are on tuition assistance. Um, we'll bring in subject matter experts from the community to come work in the school. So we have a recording studio that's taught by a local music production person. We have a professional Aikido instructor. We have a hip hop instructor that teaches hip hop in the city and comes and teaches. So we bring in uh, flavors and teachers and real world practitioners into the environment with the kids. And then the kids go out and perform. So our, our terms are six weeks long. Uh, every six weeks the kids take on two big quests, two big interdisciplinary projects. They work on those with mentors from the real world community. These could be architects, these could be people from Google, this could be a, a chef. They work on those projects with them and at the end of the week, end of the term, they present to a panel of experts. And so they go out in the world and present. This is an example of the kids in a kitchen where they're presenting their, their, their project that they worked on that, that term. And then they have a week off in intercession where they do something completely different as a week. They go camping, they, they build an urban garden, they do a community service project, and then they come back and pick two new questions. Uh, so it's very much integrated, the facilities, the space, the people, it very much feels like the kids are in the middle of downtown San Francisco working in the real world. So Jeff and I were just in a session on uh, connected learning and we talked a lot about uh, place-based education on gettingsmart.com. There's a, a, about 80 blogs on place-based ed, hashtag place-based ed if you want to learn more about that. Matt, um, you usually go into retail space. We go into regular shop fronts on city streets. A lot of the ideas are related to what Jeff was just talking about, trying right. to have the school embedded in the community. Uh, and a lot of our thinking is about sort of deinstitutionalizing the concept of school, going back to the way it used to work before the Prussian ideas invaded. Yeah. Uh, and you know, generally speaking, the evidence shows that teachers are happier in teeny schools, and kids are happier in teeny schools, and uh, achievement gaps are smaller in tiny schools. And so that's sort of the idea of place is so right. small that it's a seamless part of the community. And when and how do they get out of the school? The door. Community, community connections. <laughs> I mean, Mon so Montessori, uh, Montessori has this idea of going out. It's a kid-centered, like when the spirit moves them to go do something, they can just go do it. If they're too young to be wandering the streets by themselves, they grab a teacher and go do it. That's cool. And, and do you have K-12 in each site? No, every site follows one three-year Montessori okay, that's what age I band. Found. Okay, great. So zero to three, three to six, uh, et cetera. Neva, you're, you're in a converted pathology lab. We are. <laughs> uh, we're in a big open warehouse space. We spent a lot of time looking at spaces that inspire creativity. It was also really important to us that we look nothing like yeah. a school. So when you walk in, you'll see students working in pods. It, it really mirrors what you might see at ID, IDEO. Um, right. The other thing I think is interesting about our space is that when we launched the school, we didn't have a building. And so we had moved out of our yeah. existing building. And so we were totally nomadic. And we just crowd surfed the community. And we were hosted by Boise State University and Jump and a, a number of other. And you did a week retreat. And we did, yeah, we were in the mountains. Um, but it was an excellent way to just throw kids into this idea of no classes, no grades, no building, um, but really practicing the idea of embrace ambiguity and a great time for us to do a lot of intentional culture teaching and team building work. So the, this question about opening a new school, the most important thing is to get the culture right. Um, everybody we talked to said that. This happy accident of not having a building and have to, having to couch surf the community um, really set up the culture to make kids resilient and, uh, and inventive and really, really tight. So it, uh, it turned out to be a really important part of the opening. 
All right. Questions? We yeah, go. I'll just mention. I mean, I, so Neva, during your first couple of weeks too. I mean, you um, also introduced the students to like trials and challenges, and like one of the places you guys were at didn't work, and you really failed fast and said, "Hey, this isn't working. We're not learning. This isn't an environment that feels suited." And you guys made a quick shift like midweek, even though you had kind of committed to spending a full week too. So I think it's this interesting piece about. Uh, you were trying and being nomadic, but also failing fast and, and prototype. Yep. Iterate, yeah. iterate, iterate. And you, you guys actually engage kids in design thinking to design the culture of their school. And sort of the space, in, too. Mm -hmm. right. We had a, t a planning team of students who right. were. Questions we didn't right. get to or things that have come up since then that you want to talk about? And try to end these uh, comments with a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a question. So, how do you help pa uh, parents? in these models? I can speak to that. That's been something that we, we from the beginning, when we were talking to students about admitting students, we have an advantage in the fact that we are tuition free. So we, we talk a lot about a quality of voice. So we offer this really unique experience that is highly personalized and, and tuition free. So when we, we interview, are we interview kids, but we interview them also with their parents. Then we interview the parents separately. Then we interview the kids separately. But so what, we really try to explain. What about to the? What to you, you still have half of your parents are like really worried about college, and you're not accredited yet, and you're kind of groovy. So how do you how do you deal with those things? Well, I, Idaho is not known for its innovation in education, and there's a lot of traditional mindset there. So for many parents, this is a real leap of faith. We have an advantage, again, because we started in 2008 as this community-based organization, and we had proven results from that. And we have a lot of trust in the community and a lot of people we've worked with in the past. Yeah. So it's been helpful. Matt, why don't you, um, a comment from you, because you, you have so many schools in so many places. Like, what role do parents play? So in regular Montessori, there's a little bit of an anti-parent uh, vibe. The, okay. the parents don't understand it. And if we explain it to them, they'll probably mess it up at home. Right. Uh, and we try to fight against that hard. Uh, we have actually explicit roles for parents in the classrooms. Um, and it's part of the same theme that you were talking about, about ways to bring in extra expertise. Uh, uh, and we also do a ton of parent education. Our theory being that the parent, that there may be a hump to get over in terms of the value of parents understanding Montessori, but it's worth getting over it. Uh, Tom, if I could just uh, add something. I, I think as a charter, if you're opening a new school, uh, particularly if it's charter, no matter how you describe your program, there are going to be parents who enroll their kids simply because nothing else has worked and they want your school to be the solution. And for us, as a personalized program, ta tailoring students' experience around their particular interests and needs, certainly there's that um, attraction. What we've done just recently with, uh, with our staffing, we've had everyone respond to a document that outlines our our um, academic design principles. So before a teacher will, will get you know, accepted for employment, they have to respond with a personal essay to this document. We're also now, this spring, providing that to all of our families. We're not requiring parents to write an essay. But <clears throat> to really have them think through what it is that we stand for and why what we do is different than what they might be comfortable with um, you know, coming from a, a more traditional mindset. Right, lightning round on uh, testing. Um, so either test that you administer or have to administer. Neva, what's the one stone view on testing? We don't love it, but we do it. Uh, we all are, of the are you administer? Are you going to administer state tests? Um, no, we do map testing, and we also ask all the students. We didn't look at grades or test scores before admitting students. We admitted students, and then we asked them to take the PSAT, and then looked at past records, just so we would have an idea of what we were looking at. And you're at. doing MAP from NWA, the Adaptive mm -hmm. Assessment, right? And m mostly to, for, for them to be able to see growth, and right. for you yeah. organizationally to demonstrate growth? Yeah, making sure that we're on the right track. All right, Matt, what's your take on 
we're still we're so new we're still sorting it out but we will probably end up in a place of we don't love it but we do it anyway okay jeff what's your take on it so we as a middle school we will prepare the kids for taking standardized tests for high school so that they can get into private schools if they want to so we'll teach that as a skill okay. but in terms of actually assessing what we want to be assessing yeah. we've got three right now we've got uh we're working with you'll see adam gazelli tonight ucsf's neuroscience lab right. to come and actually test the cognitive capacities of the kids so we're more interested in actually showing changes in executive functioning over time. Right. We're working with uh, Greater Good Science Center's uh, SEL group to actually assess and measure the social emotion. So we're testing things that we think are important for our own benefit, right. less for proving to anybody outside that they're ready to get into high school. We think, right. we think we're testing things that are more important. And Mike, your K-12's uh, charter, you get so the full meal deal. We, we, we use the map by choice okay. to help students track their own progress and for us to identify specific needs that need to be um, addressed and basic skills and so forth. And then we're, we're obligated to take the state uh, s set of assessments. Your, your school is so cool. What hasn't he described well, Mark? Uh, you know, we do a Montessori at home program. Yeah. For, because homeschooling is big in Utah, and so uh, parents come in and they get trained on how to do the Montessori uh, training at home, and then they get supported. And they have a, we do a uh, like a once a month. Parents come in and they talk about their experience, that sort of thing. We have uh, 35 parents doing Montessori at home, and they have the manipulatives and, and so for the right. works that they can check out. One or two more things that have come up. What didn't we answer? What else? Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm interested in hearing how you address issues of equity in your schools and how you're thinking about the achievement slash opportunity gap, how you're measuring, et cetera. Thanks. Most interested in little kids or big kids? Or both? Okay, the, the equity thing. This is uh, probably gonna be our close out question. So I'll give you each um, 30 seconds on the equity question. We'll, we'll start with Mike. So our, our objective is to help every individual child achieve their potential. And we've realized that a lot of students are coming in with, with deficits and we've invested very heavily. We've spent this year about 260,000 beyond what we had budgeted initially specifically for literacy support to help students be in a position where they can take responsibility for their own learning. And, and so we're, we've, we've seen dramatic success in the number of students who are now coming up to grade level um, do you, do you have to recruit uh, to get a, a diverse group of students? Uh, no, our, our population, I think, is more diverse than most uh, schools. In but the a little bit area. of a dumbbell population, right? Where, you, as you described earlier, if you have some struggling students that haven't been successful in traditional school and some under-challenged. Per particularly at the secondary level, but, right. but still, I don't think we have a normal distribution even at the lower level. And we've, we're a public school, so we have a special ed education program. And our, our percentages are more than 50% above the state average in terms of the number of students that qualify right. for special ed services. And we, we've done such a good job that many other parents, like our waiting lists, oftentimes are disproportionately number of, of parents who have heard about the services that we provide and they're very frustrated with what's being provided at their local school. Right. All right, Jeff, you talked earlier about uh, in, trying to be intentional on equity mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. number of kids that you have on scholarship. Yeah. So I'd say there's a structural component and an instructional component. And the st uh, structural component would be that we're very intentional with our flex tuition program. We have scholarships for um, over half of our kids and we intentionally select for diversity and spread everyone out across the spectrum from zero up to full pay so that we don't have the dumbbell effect. Um, and then instructionally, um, we've got a couple things that are working well. One is in these little advisor groups, we have taught the kids how to do a restorative justice model and they process issues with themselves. So anytime somebody feels like, you know, they weren't included at the birthday party or somebody said something to them that was inappropriate, the kids then have to go into the group and they have to process it. We've actually taught a course, we taught a course um, titled, Have We Effectively Dealt With Slavery in America? And the kids spend six weeks studying the uh, downstream effects of prejudice and racism. So that's an actual class we're teaching to you know, 12 year olds. So I think we're, we're really embedding it holistically as but much I, as we can. I bet all of you struggle with hiring uh, diverse and uh, trained staff, right? Faculty is hard to find. Yeah, mm -hmm. Matt, uh, thoughts on equity? Uh, it's, 
great question, super important. Uh, I think there are multiple levels of this. One is the how do you make sure you have uh, intentional diversity of kids. For us, that means we place schools on neighborhood boundaries, typically on the low income side of neighborhood boundaries. And we, are, uh, we just got our first charter approved and we're working on district partnerships so that they are accessible economically to all kids and in locations where they'll be uh, racially and ethnically diverse. Uh, there is a, the, the population of Montessori teachers is, uh, is tilts towards middle, upper middle class white women. Uh, and so we uh, are in the people we pay for. We're focused on training people of color and others uh, who, for one reason or another, are not part of the mainstream Montessori population. Um, we do equity training with our teachers to help bring the ones who are, uh, who this is the first topic, first time they've had this conversation, uh, uh, help bring them into the conversation in new ways. Uh, and we are hiring uh, from the set of Montessorians of color and Montessorians with a uh, focus on social justice and equity training. We are uh, gobbling up those people to add to our staff to make sure that energy is strong inside of us. Eva, what does equity look at, like at uh, One Stone? Equality of voice is a value of One Stone. And for us, that means that understanding that everyone has a story, using empathy to understand what that story might be, and then having the courage to be who you are. So it doesn't matter if you're 18 or you're 80, your voice is equally respected at One Stone. And we strip away as many things as possible so that we can provide an, a space where students feel, students and coaches feel an, the ability to be them, their true authentic selves. I think it takes a lot of courage to do that, and so we tried to put that in place. We have never charged any membership dues or fees or tuition, because as soon as money enters that question, then it changes the conversation. So at the high school, you've, you've tried hard uh, to r recruit and uh, admit a, a diverse group, diverse in many different <laughs> many dimensions, ways. right? Yeah, Academically diverse, diverse learners, uh, diverse socioeconomics. But, yes. you're, but you're also an after-school program, and you, there's some effort in that program. Right, right? yes. And, and where, where we live is, uh, is largely white, um, but there are, there are pockets. Um, Boise is a refugee resettlement community, so we see some new American kids. Um, if you go outside of Boise, there's uh, a, a large Latino population. So our, I, I think when it comes to race, race and ethnicity, that's what maybe a more challenging area, but as far as the students we admitted, when they took the PSAT, we had a student in the one percentile and a student in the 99 percentile. And students bring all different kinds of schools of thought to the table too. Uh, but very accepting place. Absolutely. One thing I love about it. That is Modern Montessori. Thank you, panel. <laughs>